I work at the African Center for Cities at the University of Cape Town. And I'm really deeply honored and to be chairing the session, and I'm really pleased to be here. And in some ways, this session is a bit of a hinge between, I think, a really excellent overview this morning on how in the related fields of studies on health and well-being and happiness and quality of life and so forth, there's been a transition to begin to understand what exactly the social and environmental determinants may mean for a much broader understanding of well-being. However, if you will, in this session, the, the, the real agenda of urban age will come to the fore. We're making the transition into questions of space and design. And we're trying to grapple with how insights in those fields over the last period can help us to enlarge the understanding about the diverse determinants and preconditions for improved well-being and livability in cities. We've got a fantastic panel. <clears throat> We've got the head of LSE Cities, Ricky Burdett, who's going to share with us the body of work that has been produced in the lead up to this event uh, by LSE Cities. We also have two excellent speakers that can give us greater insight into the city where we find ourselves. And then we will conclude with the perspective from Mozambique, a neighbor of South Africa where I, where I am from. And that will share with us how does one think about these questions when the resources and the capabilities that would be evident in a city such as Hong Kong is simply not available, is not in evidence, is not something that one can draw in as a resource in thinking about these questions as a way of destabilizing some of the taken for granted assumptions that I think has filtered through this morning about how to think about these questions. Now, I've got two issues that I want to briefly flag. The one is, I'm, when Ricky showed that slide this morning of uh, the imaginary of, of the plague in London, I was reminded of Anthony King's work that demonstrates how health discourses and particularly the spread of the bubonic plague in many cities around the global south fulfilled an absolutely fundamental role in the shaping of space. If I think of Cape Town itself in 1889, when the bubonic plague broke out, it was the rationale for the first act of violent segregation on racial lines of the indigenous population from the core of the city into the first black settlement called Langa. And I will speak tomorrow about the most recent black settlement called Kailicha. But these things have all, the precursors to them have been discourses about hygiene and about cleanliness. And of course, the, the associations that were drawn between those discourses and a particular imaginary of what social structures should look like. And I think it's just an import, important cautionary tale as we think about the design and the spatial implications of dealing with some of the questions. The second point I wanted to flag was a curiosity that I had from my own personal life. I know everything that I should do to live a healthy life. Um, and I don't do any of it. And, uh, and I'm fairly privileged. I have a fairly decent education. I can read and I can engage and so forth. So there seems to me to be a paradox, a, a profoundly human paradox in a lot of what we talk about and, uh, when it comes to health, that the, it's not always or necessarily a question about education. There's a whole bunch of other stuff going on that makes us act paradoxically. And it seems to me that when we're thinking about design and when we're thinking about the reordering of space and the interaction between people and space, which for me translates into the, if you will, calibration of cultural patterning, then we have to be very, very cautious because interesting cities, good cities, if you will, are places that are a little bit like me. They don't do what they're supposed to do. They don't respond to formal governmental intentionalities in the way that one would expect them to. And that's kind of what makes them interesting. So with that kind of um, curiosity in my own mind, I'm really curious about what, what can design do, if you will, to effect social engineering, because that's really what we're talking about, but at the same time, respect contingency. 
And I can think of very few people around the globe who can address this particular question more eloquently than Ricky Badet. I'm not going to introduce all the speakers. They're on the program. The bios are also in the program. In the interest of time, I will hand over straight to Ricky. Thanks.